Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira, on this big result day of the Karnataka Assembly elections. The story so far is that the BJP has emerged as the single largest party in the state, but has fallen short of the magic figure of 112 in the 225-member state assembly, where polling was held for 222 seats on May 12th. In an attempt to stop the Saffron Party from forming the government, the JDS with 37 seats has accepted second-placed Congress's proposal with 78 seats to form uh, for a, for a post-poll alliance to form the government. It seems like the Congress has learned some lessons from Goa, Meghalaya and Manipur and has come up with a strategy to form a government led by Devagauda's son, H.D. Kumaraswamy. The BJP led by Yadirappa too has met the governor to stake claim to form the government. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will discuss the political message from the election results today. Joining me on the program now are Shekhar Rayar, political editor, Deccan Herald and Sandeep Balakrishna, columnist. Thank you gentlemen for joining me on The Big Picture here today. Before we get to the political message, let's talk about what's happening in Karnataka. Shekhar Rayar. A difficult situation as far as the governor is concerned or is it is his task easy going by previous precedents well the, there are several precedents and the governor has a, a bouquet of options to choose from whether to call the single largest party or whether to call uh, since there is no pre-poll alliance here or whether to call a formation which he thinks is stable so several options are open and uh, we are going to see a lot of uh, political games being played in the next uh, 48 hours. Who is in a better position as the numbers stand right now? Well, if it's pure arithmetic, if you're thinking of pure arithmetic, then, well, you have the JDS and Congress together adding up to 160. But I think the situation that is evolving in Karnataka is just not arithmetic. Hmm. There's a lot of chemistry involved in this. Okay. <laughs> and that chemistry within JDS and the chemistry within Congress, because after all, what we get to understand the day-long uh, kind of uh, activity that went on in the JDS circle, particularly Kumaraswamy outsmarting his own father in openly declaring, uh, uh, you know, his acceptance of the Congress offer, right. is itself is creating ripples. Because by the time Gulab Nabi Azad announced that they are going to meet uh, Devagoda, the Kumaraswamy was ready with the letter. That also shows how desperate the JDS was to come back to power and sit at the Chief Minister's seat. Uh, uh, Sandeep, as far as Kumaraswamy is concerned, because the JDS has been out of power for over a decade now. Absolutely. <clears throat> so, if you look at the JDS's bravado, and we've been tracking this throughout the day, as you know, uh, one narrative that uh, JDS put out was that, you know, we, we are the kingmaker, we are the kingmaker. But actually, it's a do or die situation for JDS. It stands to lose the most. Because you look at the campaign trail, What's happened, it's traditional Muslim support base deserted en masse to Congress. And so the number of backers may, I mean, be it in the realm of uh, finance or karyakartas or whatever, it made a poor showing actually on the campaign trail, if you look at it realistically. So in which case, now the Congress is equally desperate because it's been wiped out at the national level anyway, and it's been wiped out uh, in all the state elections. So. They are ready to eat humble pie despite having more than double the seats in this, uh, uh, whatever the present in, in the present scenario. Present scenario. But it's willing to play second fiddle and it's willing to, you know, Mr. Sidramaya has already submitted his resignation. It's willing to sideline Sidramaya. So, what does this show? Two desperate, I'm sorry to use the word, losers coming together just in order to keep out one party. An objective. Uh, assessment reveals just this one. Hmm. Okay, fine. Let let me take the point that you are making to our uh, to our political guests on the program uh, who are joining us now. Nalin Kohli, national spokesperson of BJP, and also Suleiman Mohammad Khan of the Congress, join us now on the program. Uh, Suleiman Mohammad Khan, let me begin with you. Of course, the big question, as far as the Congress is concerned, is keeping the flock together. Are you going to be able to do that over the next few days? It is a matter of, uh, to my understanding, it is a matter of shame if Congress party or JDS has to, you know, guard its MLAs or to keep the flock together. It is a matter of shame and it's not democracy, it's not constitutional democracy, rather it's called horse trading, one. Second, some of your guests on the panel said 
that's a sheer desperation of JDU and Congress. JDS. And two losers coming together to form the government. JDS, yes, JDS. So I may, may I on the behalf of Congress party say, yes, Congress party is desperate. Congress party is desperate for farmers. Congress party is desperate for Dalits. Congress party is de desperate for backwards. Congress party is desperate for economy. Congress party is desperate to save the nation. Can we also act desperate to stay in power? Therefore, we are doing this desperation. One. One. No, not at all. Not at all. Rather, BJP is desperate for power. They have done this in Goa. They have done this in Manipur. They have done this in Meghalaya. They can do anything. They lost in Bihar. Our alliance won in Bihar. And now they are in government in Bihar by, although Lalu Prasad Yadavji is the single largest party. In Goa, we were the single largest party. And on the issue of who has to be invited as a, as a party to form the government, governor, I have a precedent in my hand. It was at the time in 1998 when then President Mr. K. R. Narayanan invited Atal Bihari Vajpayee ji to form the government. I'll just read two lines, four lines out of it. Former President Shri K. R. Narayanan elaborated in his communi dated 12th of March 1998 when he invited Shri Atal Bihari Vajpayee to form the government. He said, when no party or pre-election pre alliance of a party is in clear majority, the head of a state in India or elsewhere, mm. Mm. given the first opportunity to the leader of a party, or the combination of the parties that has won the largest number of seats. So, a party who has the largest seat or a combination which has the greatest, greater, larger number of seats has to be invited. This is the precedent. So, okay. this is what so I'm going to take the point that you're making. I'm going to take the point that you're making to Nalin Kohli now. Nalin Kohli, if you go by arithmetic, the BJP is well short of the magic figure. Where are you going to get these additional MLAs from? The Congress is suggesting that the BJP is going to indulge in horse trading. I'll first answer a few things wearing my political hat. And then, as an advocate, I'd like to clear a few doubts. Because when my friend from the Congress party is quoting the Narayanan principle, then he should understand in what context the Narayanan principle was. The Congress party, if it says it is desperate for farmers, for agrarian, for Dalits, etc., then how is it that the Congress party is not being re-elected? They have lost the election. They have conclusively lost the election. The BJP is not well short. The BJP is just short. There's a huge difference between well short, which is applicable to the Congress party. But Nalin party. Kohli, you two have not won the election. Seats away. Let, let's After get one, one thing straight. You two have not won the election. Less than a... Yes. But we have got the mandate. We have certainly become the single largest party. It's not the first time in this country that a single largest party is there. The Narayanan principle is specific. And I'm thankful that my friend has pointed it out. The Narayanan principle is specific to the single largest party or the, the pre-poll alliance. That is what it was, the Narayanan principle. With regard to government formation, when there's no clear majority, the, you need to understand it in context of the governor has the choice to call the single largest or to call a group, depending on the situation. But single largest precedence is established in law, primarily on the basis of the SR Bomai judgment, which is the 1993 judgment, and then the Rameshwar judgment, which is nine, uh, our five bench. That was nine judge bench. This is a five judge bench. In both of them, ultimately, the test is the floor of the house test. For any government to form, even if Mr. Yadurappa is called, the first step would be the pro tem speaker for giving the oath to every MLA. Then the election of the speaker, and thereafter is the flow test. So ultimately, the test of democracy, beyond all the adjectives that any political party may choose to uh, use, is the floor of the house test. Sure. That you know, is your, your point taken. I, I completely accept test. your point. I completely you accept your point. Any name you wish. Hear me out. Hear me out. I completely accept your point. But where are the numbers? Where, 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 how are you going to make up for the numbers? Because you're, going to sh you're, you're still falling short. That is a matter of strategy. You don't expect me to sit on national TV and tell you all of that. Once the, government, once the BJP is invited, the steps are, thereafter it is given time, within that time it has to. Atal Bihari Vajpayee ji couldn't get those numbers, so he resigned. So therefore that's how it is, it's not very complicated. 
end of the day, sitting in a TV studio, no numbers are going to make any difference. <clears throat> what will make difference is only what are the numbers when the confidence motion is moved. Hmm. It's a confidence motion for a government there. It's a no confidence motion if the opposition moves it. Okay, sure. Let me, let me take the point that you're making forward now. You know, how do you see things panning out in the days to come, Shekhar Ayer? I know it's a difficult question. I know it's difficult for you to predict how things are going to pan out. But are we going to see the dark side of Karnataka politics all over again? No, well, you cannot rule out anything in this scenario because whoever gets to get the invite will definitely, you know, will do all uh, he, he can to uh, see that he wins the vote of confidence. Because if Idrupa were to get invited first, between 104 and 112 or 13, you need just 8 or 9 people to support. Now, this could happen. One cannot predict how this will happen. Mm. But definitely, whoever has the invite. Now, if Edirappa were to get an invite with, 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 uh, with uh, the party you know, which is ruling at the center, probably within the MLAs, there could be a lot of churning and thinking, you know, which is the stabler arrangement. Do we go for an arrangement where there is a 38 MLA formation supported by 68 MLA formation? Or do we look at uh, 104 with possibly uh, just a handful of MLAs needed to cross the halfway mark? So this, the very fact that whoever gets the invite will, 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 will get the first opportunity. And do you think whoever gets the invite will be in a better position to form the government as well? Absolutely, because th that, that itself will send a signal to... See, the ultimate desire of the people are the MLAs. Hmm. MLAs who have you know, with hard-fought uh, win, they'll be looking at the options. What, and, of course, you have the anti-defection law, which, which, is, which is very clear, who can break, break away from what kind of group. Because you need a whole lot to go and merge with another party. Right. So there are hurdles, there are situations. So, and as I said before, that at the beginning, the governor has a bouquet of options. Hmm. And a bouquet of presidencies. Okay, so the, the governor is spoiled for choice is what you're saying at the, uh, right now. But uh, Sandeep Balakrishnan, as far as, um, uh, you know, the governor itself is concerned, we saw both sides meeting the governor. We saw press conferences after that as well. So clearly, it doesn't look like the governor has sent any side any feelers because both sides are very confident that they're going to form the government. Yeah, so far it looks like that. And uh, I think I remember reading some news just now that... Uh, BJP has a parliamentary meet or something at 7. Perhaps uh, that might open up new information for us. Right now, like, I fully concur with Mr. Iyer. So it could go anyway. Sure. Let's take the discussion forward now with my political guest, starting with uh, Suleiman Mohammad Khan, about what is the message as far as the election result is concerned for the Congress. Two points, then, then I answer your question. One... It's very ironic, it's ironical that the BJP spokesperson is quoting S.R. Bumai when they have themselves not respected S.R. Bumai when they have toppled our government in Uttaranchal and Arunachal whereby and later on Supreme Court has taken them to task and restored our government, quoting the same S.R. Bumai. One. Second, BJP is at least eight MLAs short of the majority mark. The other, all other MLAs, JDS, Congress, Bhaujan Samaj one MLA and one MLA, independent MLA. All, are, all MLAs are against BJP or with the Congress JDS alliance. So where will they get the numbers? The anti-defection law is very clear. Either they'll break some party by luring them in some horse trading. I don't know what they will do. So they should clarify on that too. And third point, your question I want to answer that this election has been, you know, popular vote. The percentage of votes polled to the Congress party is 38%, which is highest among all political parties. BJP got 36%, Congress got 38%. So still the popular vote is with the Congress. Maximum number of people of Karnataka have voted for Congress. Although we are second, standing second in the tally number you, of tally of seats. You know, Suleiman, Suleiman Mohammad Khan, un unfortunately for you, party. Unfortunately for you, that's not going to count for anything because it's not translating into seats at the end of the day. At the end of the day in India, seats are what matter and you don't have that. Where we went wrong? We have to do sit on the drawing board. We have to analyze where we lost the election. So we'll see. Let's the final tally comes and all the constituencies numbers comes. But as on today, at this moment, Congress party and JDS are the prime contenders for form the, forming the government and it is as per the constitutional norms.
Nalan, I'm just going to come to you, but before that, Sandeep has some, uh, something to add. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Just May a limited point on now. the uh, vote share, the percentages. In uh, 2013 elections, Congress party got about 39.06%. And with that percentage, uh, it, it was able to secure 122 seats. And uh, currently, you have about 37 percent, 37.9, 38, close yeah. to 38 nearly. So with that, it has lost more than 50 seats. So how does the two things square? Whereas the BJP with, uh, I mean, whatever, fractured BJP back then had about 19 percent. And uh, KJP, uh, Sri Ramalu's party, all that put together, you, you got some 40, 41 seats. And now with just 36%, it's translated into a number of uh, seat tally of 104. Sure. So this, I mean, it's quite bizarre actually. As long as it doesn't translate, the vote percentages really don't matter. Right. True. That's true. But you know, I think 2013 is is a diff difficult yardstick to to yeah to, to yeah. compare as yeah. well because let's not forget the BJP yeah. was My the votes were split between BJP and KJP correct, as well. Correct, correct. So, but uh, Nalan Kohli, uh, you know, uh, the Congress spokesperson did have a point as far as the popular mandate is concerned. If you go by the vote share figures and if you compare it with 2014, clearly the percentage as far as the BJP is concerned has dropped. Is that something that concerns you? Is there a message for you in that? Two comments first on what Mr. Suleiman was saying. As far as India is concerned as a constitutional democracy from 1947 and 50 when the constitution came into operation, it was adopted. Till date, in India, governments are formed on the basis of either the number of MPs that are one or the MLAs in a state assembly. It's not one on the basis of vote share percentage. Should there in the ever in the future, in the realm of uh, probability or improbability, be a change in this and it's on vote share, the Congress may claim victory on that when that comes. Currently, they can ca keep looking at a Pyrrhic victory and take the consolation that, you know, like in um, Gorakhpur or in Pulpur, their candidates lost the deposit, but they celebrated it as a victory because the BJP didn't win. So therefore, they are entitled to that high standard in the democratic setup that we have. We have no complaints with that. The second part is uh, with regard to SR Bomai. That's a judgment, a nine judgment. In Uttarakhand, yes, 356 was imposed. The court ruled against us. So did the Supreme Court. The people elected us. What matters at the end of the day is the election. As in this case in Karnataka, the people have voted out the Congress. They are questioning the BJP with a gap of seven seats for majority in 122 or 8, if I take it as the upper limit, including the Speaker, compared to the fact that they are 38 seats away from that mark, or 34 in this case. So therefore, I don't know what uh, argument is the Congress building. The last part, you, me, anyone else can profess and talk about anything. What matters, like Shekhar pointed out, the election laws, in terms of defection, anti-defection laws, those are applicable. The rest of it, at the end of the day, what happens on the floor of the house is sacrosanct. And that is not even something that can be called into judicial review. Because at the end of the day, the floor of the house is supreme in terms of the principle of the floor test. And a nine-judge bench in Bomai and a five-judge bench in Rameshwar has established it beyond doubt. Now, if the Congress party wants to use adjectives for that, it wants to use adverbs for the process. They are entitled. But that is the functioning of democracy. If it suits them and when they form governments, it's good. If it doesn't suit them and the mandate doesn't go or the floor of the house, voting doesn't go in their favor, so be it. And my final political point, if the Congress is so confident of the claims of the numbers, then they have nothing to worry. Then certainly on the floor test today, they will succeed to vote out a government that has been given a possibility of seven days to prove it. Hmm. The very fact that they are constantly arguing on this some way shows the lack of conviction that the numbers are not with them, but they are staking a claim on numbers that they believe are there with them. Sure, okay. You know, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the Congress spokesperson on the program to respond to any of what you said right now. But let me ask you another question. If everything goes well for the BJP and you are in a position to form the government despite of getting 104, despite falling short of the halfway mark, will B.S. Yadurappa still be your chief minister?
Is there any doubt on that? He's been declared so, but ultimately in terms of process, you need to bear in mind the parliamentary board of the party is what is the authorized, the highest body which takes decisions about it. In terms of the election itself, he's been declared so, but that process will happen with the parliamentary board. And uh, we have to follow that because in our party, it's not an individual who decides it. Some parties do follow that system. They are entitled to. In our party, the parliamentary board decides it. Okay, great. Thank you for answering that, answering that question honestly. You're saying that if the BJP does form the government, it will indeed be BS Yadurappa. Probably a lesson that the BJP has learned from 2013 as well. Because Yadurappa did cause the BJP a lot of harm uh, in the previous election. Shekhar, I have taken the discussion forward. We've spoken about Yadurappa. What about Siddharamaya? Is it the end of the road for Siddharamaya's political career? No, see, at the moment, it looks like he was left with no choice to go with the High Command's decision to back uh, Kumaraswamy. No, but looking at what but, has happened with no. the, with Siddharamaya and H.D. De Devagauda in the past, will Siddharamaya and JDS be able to gel together? That That's, that's I think, a very difficult proposition for Siddharamaya. You see, after all, he had broken away from JDS and found his own feet and created his own kind of, uh, uh, ran the government as per his choice. And he has a bunch of supporters who had come away from JDS then. Now, how will they swallow the situation? Because this is a completely new situation. Apart from Siddharamaya, there are leaders like D.K. Shiv Kumar, who have never got along well with the Gauda family. Now, what happens to them? And Shiv Kumar is a senior Wakalinga leader. Now, these are leaders who, who will have to look at the situation. Or for take, for instance, Malik Arjun Karge. Well, Karge is a very senior leader. He is a, he's a Dalit leader. And two days before the you know, counting, we saw Sudaramaya coming with a proposal, why not a Dalit CM? So here is a situation where Congress is getting into an, uh, an arrangement without any of those lofty moral ground. You see, the defeat was a moral loss. But here the strategy is uh, Congress no longer wants to pursue that moral path. Rather, it would, would like to prevent a moral win for BJP. Talking about moral loss, where does it leave Rahul Gandhi? Well, I think uh, in the whole this that is happening now, we are not getting to see Rahul Gandhi because I'm not too sure whether Rahul Gandhi would like this approach because uh, the very fact that the high command here, it could be Sonia Gandhi herself who has taken charge and dispatched uh, seniors like... But Rahul like, Gandhi is the president of the ASC. No, he's the president, but you know, he also had attacked uh, Deva Gauda. He had also attacked Kumaraswamy. And because it was needed, necessary part of Congress strategy. Similarly, Sundra Mayer did. It, it's a very difficult situation. So therefore, within the Congress, there could be a lot of, you know, for, for this uh, higher goal of keeping BJP out. There's a lot of things they will have to swallow and adjust. And whether this kind of coalition arrangement, JDS plus Congress, how long can it run? Yeah, you at, know, that, that's what I wanted see, to come at best, to. At best, people would not give it beyond, say, the next Lok Sabha election. Sure, you know, the, you know, the JDS's track record with whoever they've been in alliance with in the past has been very bad, Sandeep. So how long is this... Marriage really going to last if it if it if at all it takes place. Yeah, before I answer that, just uh, just to add to some of his um, excellent points, actually, at one time, not one time, just about a month before, uh, one of the big Congress leaders said, you know, they hadn't announced uh, in case of a Congress victory that Siddharamaiah would continue as a CM. There's no CM candidate announced. So one big Congress leader, I, I remember uh, giving a uh, speaking to some local Kannada media where he said. There are at least six or eight CM contenders. So you can guess all these the same senior leaders uh, who Mr. Ayer just mentioned. Parameshwara. Yeah, Parameshwara. Parameshwara yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. So what does it tell you? So then on your point about uh, JDS's track record in managing coalitions, they've been married to both parties in the past, and with equal swiftness they've divorced both. So, like he said, uh, you know, this is a marriage of convenience, definitely, with a lot of uh, fighting even before. Uh, they get they tie the knot. Sure. Quick uh, closing comment from you, Nalin Kohli, before I wrap up the program. In case you do form the government in Karnataka, what is your focus going to be? What is the kind of government that you are going to see in Karnataka? Because the BJP's track record in the past in the state too hasn't been too good. Well, I wouldn't agree with that fully. We lost one election because obviously we do know that there was a a situation with Mr. Yedurappa then forming his own party. But then we've come back also with 104 seats. So I won't really buy that argument. 
But with regard to the nation, I think the agenda has always been governance, sabka saath, sabka vikas. This is a government that works for every segment, and that's an agenda of governance. In Karnataka, the chief minister and his team would, but one would obviously expect that there would be there something in terms of governance and delivery for everyone, whether it's the farmers, whether it's the marginalized groups of society, whether it is the urban part, whether it's infrastructure, whether it is employability. So there are many, many things to be done. And the very fact that there is a complete election mandate against the Congress in terms of it losing the election conclusively, the CM losing in a constituency too. Sure. Uh, all of it clearly points out too that that was a, a, a governance that didn't work. And certainly we are going to move beyond that. You are going to move beyond that with a Hawkeye from Delhi on Bengaluru? You want to answer that? In our case, we take our inspiration from Prime Minister Modi's agenda of Sapka Saad, Sapka Vikas. Okay, all right. On that note, then, I'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective. For us, our continuous coverage of Counting Day will continue on the other side. Stay tuned.